have done is done the pastoral, let us pray, because then everyone silences them. But actually, let us pray. Oh. Almighty God and everlasting Father, we give you thanks once more for gathering us here today in your name and for this opportunity to hear about the spread of your word in different parts of the world. So grant us your blessing now, um, this morning, and help us focus on that work that you are doing, O oh Lord, through the spread of your word. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, um, this, um, I have the, the pleasure to introduce to you um, a couple of people that are going to be speaking um, for our group here this morning. So this is the Reverend Dr. Quentin Cundiff and his wife, Lindsay. And their son is um, somewhere. In your office, yeah. laying down. <laughs> yeah. So he's so. 11 and he's going through a growth spur right now, so he's very tired. <laughs> so, um, Pastor Cundiff and his family are going to uh, Luther Academy in Latvia. So he'll explain what that means and where that is and some of the work. Um, just a couple of quick notes, and I know I've explained some of this before, but just as a reminder. So he and I actually met several years ago now, both going through um, the same doctoral program at Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne. Um, he went through it a little bit faster than I did. So he just graduated, got his degree this last year. And um, another um, one of those other connections that we mentioned is the church that Pastor Whitney is going to, uh, coming up, um, is a church where Pastor Cundiff and his family are just exited and just left. Um, so, um, there's also, we just found out, we have some other guests here, I'm not going to put you on the spot so don't worry, but, um, who live in the area that are old friends of the family and lots of connections, right? So, it's a very small Lutheran world. Thanks to God for that. Yeah. Is the exchange between the two pastors intentional? Or is that just... No, that's... It, it was entirely the Lord's doing. Okay. <laughs> it, it absolutely was, yeah. Maybe intentional by God. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, um, with no further ado, I will hand it on over to the cup. All right. Very good. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Wonderful to have so many of you here. I commend you all for for coming and making part of your Sunday life together, doing Bible study. It's such an important part of congregational life. So it's, it's just absolutely a pleasure to see so many of you gathered together. This morning, I want to start our presentation by asking you guys a question. What is the oldest national Lutheran church body in the world? The church of what country? Germany? All right. That's a good guess, but that's wrong. Switzerland? No, also not correct. Latvia, yes. And usually after there's a couple of wrong answers, people go, well, let's see here. He just asked the question. This guy's going to Latvia. So, right, they put it together. Yes, um, the Latvian church actually officially adopted Lutheran theology in 1523 and so they were the first uh, national church to accept it and it's because Johannes Bugenhagen how many of you guys have heard of Johannes Bugenhagen all right some of, some of you have right so say it with me Johannes Bugenhagen it's just fun to say isn't it yeah. um, but Bugenhagen was Luther's pastor so he was the guy who was caring for Luther when he was in Wittenberg. And so Bugenhagen was from an area in Eastern Europe called Pomerania, which you don't find on maps anymore, but... Right, <laughs> exactly, exactly, right? And so uh, he was traveling back home with some of Luther's writings, and Bugenhagen stopped in Riga, Latvia, and shared Luther's writings with them, and that was in 1521. By 1523, the people said, yes, we are on board. And so next year, the Latvian church is going to celebrate 500 years of existence, which is really, really cool, right? So one of the questions that people often have is, where exactly is Latvia, right? So we've got it here on this map. Yeah, Latvia is up here in red, okay? So just to kind of help orient you a little bit uh, geographically, this is Russia, 
This is Ukraine, right? Both have been in the news quite a bit. So this is Latvia. This is Ukraine. This is Latvia. This is Ukraine. Notice Latvia not in Ukraine. Um, very important because there are lots of people who are very concerned about that for us. And um, yeah, there, there actually, there's quite a distance. It's a 14 hour drive from Riga to Kiev, right? So there's, there's not like errant missiles gonna be flying into Latvia or something, right? So that's a good thing. But let's talk about Latvia a little bit more, right? So one of the symbols that's very important for the Latvian people is their flag. And so the Latvian flag, a very simple flag, but it's actually one of the oldest recognized flags on earth that has been used continually since the 1200s. And it's been used since the Latvian people were Christianized. The Latvian people were Christianized through uh, crusades in the 1200s. And so they began using this flag at that time. And within the last century, it has become a very important uh, touchstone for the Latvian people. It's very much a symbol that they hold near and dear to their hearts. Just like we as Americans hold our national flag near and dear to our hearts as well. There's another symbol that's going to be important for our work, which is the symbol for Luther Academy. This is the seal for Luther Academy. And we put the English one up here because I figured the Latvian one wouldn't mean as much, right? <laughs> but let, we can actually learn a whole lot about Luther Academy just by looking at this symbol, okay? So let's break it down a little bit. What's right here in the middle? Luther's robes. So, what kind of theology is being taught at this school? Lutheran. Lutheran theology. Now, there's a couple of keys. Who is it that publicly administers the office of the keys? Pastors. Good job. Man, your people are catechized. Great. Okay. Yes, pastors. So, this is a Lutheran school which trains pastors. So, it's a what? It's a seminary. Right, this is a seminary. And Luther Academy was actually planted through mission efforts of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod in the 90s, after Latvia was no longer part of the Soviet Union. And we're going to talk about that here yet. But there's one other part of this symbol that is important, because this symbol actually tells us where the school is at. <coughs> This little rooster with a crown on it. How many of you have ever seen that in a liturgical setting? <laughs> okay, sometimes it's on top of churches. It's actually the symbol for Riga. And so it's on top of some of the churches and other buildings in Riga. So this is Riga, Latvia. Riga, Latvia is a city of about 600,000 people which in this part of the country we said it's similar to to Portland, like proper Portland. Or like three um, times the size of Portland. Right. <laughs> um, so it's a very large city, right? Uh, lots, of, lots of beautiful architecture and stuff. Um, if, and in Riga, there is this church as well, which is St. Peter Church. This is the home or the birthplace of the Reformation in Latvia. It, it was to this church that Bugenhagen brought Luther's writings in 1521. And as of a couple of weeks ago, this is again a functioning Lutheran congregation. So it had been open and services could be done in there and stuff, but and it was how many of you have been to Europe before? Okay? Um, so you know how a lot of times in Europe these great big churches are basically touristy, right? That was kind of what this was. But recently they actually were able to place and restart a congregation in this church. So how long did I say that the Lutheran theology has been in Latvia? 
500 years. And so in those 500 years, the church has grown some deep roots, like the Latvian forest. And one of the things that, so I served in the Northwest. My first call was to the Oregon coast. And <laughs> it, it, it was beautiful, though. Right? And it, it's, it's striking to me how different the, the forests are in the American Northwest from, uh, from the Latvian forest, right? But we still know what happens, right? What happens to trees when the storms come and they don't have deep roots? They fall, right? And so the church in Latvia has had to grow some very deep roots, and it's had 500 years to do so, thanks be to God. So let's look at some of those roots. Let's see what those roots look like. Prior to World War II, this was a children's program at a congregation in Latvia. What a joy yeah. to have that many young faces. Yeah. Let's, let's keep following them. And so, after World War II, there were a number of Latvians that were actually displaced from Latvia, and they were living in a refugee camp in Nuremberg. Now, what was going on in Nuremberg, Germany, after World War II? The trials. The trials. And that's all everyone thinks about, right? But in Nuremberg, they also had a Latvian uh, refugee camp. And they gathered the children together for a confirmation class. Pastor, does this look like your confirmation class? <laughs> Nick, I can guarantee this is not what your confirmation class is. <laughs> but it's a joy. I mean, look at all these faces. Look at all these young kids gathered together to hear God's word and to grow in this faith. And of course, the confirmation program always culminates with confirmation itself. See these young people in their white robes? The whole, con the whole community comes out to rejoice with them. Right? And if I can point out to you, this is when they're in exile. This is not when they're like, you know, safe in their own country. This is in exile. Right. Um, and so, you know, these are the roots of the Lutheran Church in Latvia. And they needed these roots because the 20th century was not kind to the Latvian people. At the beginning of the 20th century, Latvia was part of the Russian Empire. When the Bolshevik Revolution happened, the Latvian people fell under communism immediately. They were part of that first stage of the Bolshevik <coughs> government. And one of the things that happened was once communism took over in Latvia and, and all throughout the Russian Empire, they actually went and killed all of the protesters that had been in favor of communism. They killed all of the Latvian communists first. So, something for us to be concerned about perhaps a bit. But, that, I mean, that, that is what has happened historically in all these different countries where communism has taken over. So, of course, communism was not working very well. People were trying to figure things out. And the people were suffering. So when World War II began, the Nazis took over. And the Nazis literally just marched in and took over. There weren't battles. There wasn't a big pitched war to conquer. They just marched in and said, we're in charge now. And the Latvians welcomed them <coughs> as liberators. Now, that's something that might make our skin crawl a little bit, right? Ooh. Oh, that's, that's not okay. But think about it from the perspective of someone in Latvia at the time, right? They are being oppressed immediately by this communist government. They are uh, suffering from shortages immediately with this new government. These guys come marching in with their tightly regimented, uh, structured, ordered, very German way of doing things, and they run the communists out. Exactly. Right? <laughs> would you perhaps would you perhaps welcome them under those kinds of settings? Well, the, Latvians, the Latvians had a 
quite a bit of German culture and yes. stock. They weren't the traditional Soviet styles. All the Baltic right. states were like, they called it a fifth column. Uh huh. When Germany invaded, because it was like that, they just moved in and the Russians got shoved out. Exactly, right. exactly. And so, then of course, they did exchange one evil for another evil, right? Yeah. right? Yeah. And it yeah. was very quickly known. Well, I was going to ask about that transition. Were perhaps the, the Nazis a little more gentle with them because of the Holocaust? Um, initially, but one of the things that we know about the Nazis is that they, they had a tendency to to essentially make make the people who they took over brought them into their evil, right? And there there are countless examples of that where people, you know, otherwise decent people got brought, you know, they just kind of got sucked into the kind of evil that the Nazis brought. And so the Nazis burned down the synagogue in Riga. And and they, they conquered Latvia prior to the creation of the death camp. And so they actually gathered up all of the all of the Jewish people, brought them out onto the beach, dug a big trench, and just oh. shot them and left their bodies in the trench. Okay. You had a question. I, don't know. I was just going to say that the Bolshevik Revolution was awful. Yes. It was terrible. I had um, my great grandparents came over and cut all ties. So I don't know where they came from other than. My great grandmother picked berries by the Red Sea or somewhere. Okay. So, but it was so terrible. And so, if you right. have this new government coming in and they say, "Oh, we're fantastic," and everybody loves us, and right? Look at all the order we have. You right. Know. Right, and and so you know it's it's important for us to be able to understand these yes. things historically, right? And so, um, one of the things that Hitler did is he actually ceded Latvia back to Russia as part of his non-aggression pact. But then of course he broke the non-aggression pact, but after World War II though, Russia was able to use that pact as their reason to come back in and take over <coughs> Latvia. So as soon as the Nazis are, are defeated, the Soviets come rolling back in. And this is not Bolshevik Revolution communists now, this is post-World War II Stalin Iron fist, right? The height of his power, the height of his madness. That's what happens. And so the Soviets roll in. And one of the things that Stalin said was that, you know, part of the reason why our <coughs> glorious revolution hasn't been quite as good as we anticipated is because there are still these Christians around. And so he actually sent his, uh, his footmen, essentially, to execute pastors. They, they were pastors who were murdered in their own homes in front of their families. And their children were, were thrown away. Their families taken into gulags. Right? Um, it was known that if you were a Christian, it was not unlike, it was not impossible that you would just simply disappear. Um, as time went on, and the Latvian church continued to exist, the pastors who were still there were publicly known as pastors, and it was not uncommon for their pastors to be um, detained by the KGB, to be um, questioned very rigorously, and then uh, beaten before being released. Right? That was life under Soviet rule. And so the Soviets left churches in a state like this. And notice that this is a new, or this is a recent picture, right? This isn't from the 1950s. This is still the state of some churches in Eastern Europe. But also, this is the bigger point here. <clears throat> this is also emblematic of the state of some churches in Western Europe, too. So, in Eastern Europe and in Western Europe, they've both suffered in the last century, right? In Eastern Europe, they suffered under the, the iron fist of Stalin and under communism. In Western Europe, the church has languished under bad theology. How many of you have ever been to a church 
where the pastor did not believe that Jesus actually rose from the dead. That's happening in Europe. Yes, now. How many of you have ever been to an, a, a Christmas Day service where the pastor never once mentioned, mentioned Jesus? That is common in Europe now. How many of you have ever been to a church where the pastor publicly teaches that Allah and our God are the same being? The same being that it's the yeah, that Allah, right? In, in Islam, right? That it's the same God. That kind of theology has absolutely shattered the church in Western Europe. You watch them auctioning off in like in England when they have these shows that auction off part of the, the buildings and stuff. Right. Right. Yeah. And so, let me ask you guys a question. Is it possible to be nice and not be a Christian? Oh, yeah. 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 Is it possible to yeah. be a good neighbor and not be a Christian? Yeah. Is it possible to be a good citizen and not be a Christian? Yeah. Yes. And so, if being a Christian just means being nice, if being a Christian means just getting along with other people, is there any reason for you to ever step foot in this building ever again? No. 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 And that is exactly the same kind of thinking that has struck the minds of so many Christians or former Christians in Europe. Here too. Yes, and here too. Yes. About six months ago, I turned on the TV early Sunday morning, and there was some kind of a service going on. I didn't get it, but then when it got to the end and was doing the credits, it called the church something something, it's in California, of Chris Long. And I'm thinking oh, Chris Long. Chris Long. Chris Long. Yeah. What is Chris Long? Well, uh, then in all the credits and stuff, and it gave the address, it was a combination church of Christians and Islam sitting in the same pews at the same service. So right. apparently it's not just right. in Europe. Right, and, and that's you're exactly right. And so all of these things that we are seeing in the church in the United States, I want you to understand that all of these things that we're seeing, going, oh, how could churches do those things? It all began in Europe. And, and that kind of theology actually comes out of German universities in the 1800s. This is actually part of the reason why our church body exists. Did you know that? In the 1800s, in the mid-1800s, it was nearly impossible for a pastor to get a call in Germany if he actually believed that God created the world in six days. If he actually believed uh, that Jesus walked on water. Right? If he actually believed these things, it was nearly impossible for a pastor to get a call. And so that was one of the big reasons why the Saxons left Germany and came to the United States. This is our theological tradition, is to actually hold the Word of God to be true. This is something that is part of our DNA because we are the historic Christian church. right? And so as we look at churches being devastated, we can remember that, yes, this is happening in Eastern and Western Europe where churches are just being left to rot. But also, theologically, many of these churches are being left to rot as well. And so the Soviets, you know, they, they definitely jumped on that bandwagon, but they did other things too, um, aside from the vandalism stuff. They turned some churches into concert halls. The, the cathedral in Germany, or not in Germany, the cathedral in Riga, they turned all the pews around to face the uh, organ and turned it into a concert hall. Think about that. For 60 years, these churches that had been places where God's word is preached, where the sacraments have been administered, where people had been baptized, confirmed, married, funerals had taken place, now nothing. Now it's a concert hall. And do you think that they played the, the good Lutheran hymns that bring glory to Christ? <laughs> Not even a little bit. Yes, in the back. 
when did the churches in Europe become uh, state churches? They have essentially been state churches since the Middle Ages. Yeah. Yes, sir. North Korea used to be the jumping off point for missionaries going to China all over the place. Uh-huh. Christianized place. When they took over the government, when the communists took over the government, they kept the hymnals and the tunes and they changed the words to worship the guy who runs the state. Yeah, and we're actually in China now. The Chinese government is trying to force Christians to rewrite the Bible in, in order to to fit the Chinese government's um, story. But they yes. Yes, yeah. Well, and so you know, as as the church um, kind of languishes, we see this stuff happen, right? So they turn some churches, St. Peter's that I showed you earlier. That church was turned into a museum, and so when. Uh, when the Soviet Union fell, it was all there. It had been preserved, so they were able to, to take it back over. Um, they turned some churches into warehouses. I, I, was, I was recently talking with um, someone in Iowa whose family is Russian-German. And uh, he went back to where his family, he, he knew where his family had, had come from. And the, the Soviets had turned that church into a swimming pool. Oh and then after they were done with it being a swimming pool, they bricked up some of the windows and turned it into a granary. Just filled it with grain, right? Yes? Several several years ago, probably 15 years ago, we had a Russian uh, pastor here who was a missionary in Russia and he's helping to rebuild some of these churches that the Soviet Union was allowing. And several of the churches they have were used as uh, gymnasiums. Yes. For their uh, Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you know, so that that's not all. They also turn some churches into nightclubs. And this is still happening today in Eastern Europe and in Western Europe, right? So just think about it. this is a place where God's holy word had been preached, where the sacraments had been administered, and now it has turned into this. And in, in Western Europe, we're seeing some of these empty churches being sold off to become nightclubs. Some of them are being sold to become mosques. I'm not sure which is worse, right? Um, but this is what's happening. And yet, and yet, in spite of all of this, the church still stands. Christ's church continues to stand. And while we're seeing in Europe so many of these state churches falling to uh, theological liberalism, a few years ago the state uh, church of Sweden voted to no longer use male pronouns to describe God. Oh, right? The Latvian church... <laughs> it kills me too. But the Latvian church has remained faithful. And there are people who desire to hear God's word to receive the sacraments. And one of the things that we have seen within the last five to ten years, actually, throughout Europe, is that there are a lot of people, especially younger people, who are coming to the faith now. Who are saying, there's got to be more to this life. There's got to be more to being a human being, to being a Christian, than just this vapid, shallow kind of consumeristically driven drivel that is coming out of the pulpits that we are hearing. And so people are actually coming and wanting to take this stuff seriously. And one of the things that happened, and also, and Pastor Shaver and I were talking about this, is that over COVID, right, the church went digital. And while that has been very difficult in some ways, what it has done, though, is it has brought a great wealth of Bible-believing Lutheran theology online. And people are connecting with this stuff. And they're saying, wait, wait, wait. You guys actually believe that the Bible's true? Yeah. You guys actually believe that this stuff matters? Yeah. Sign me up! Right? <laughs> and so, as they're doing this, we're seeing new young men stepping forward and saying, I want to serve as a pastor. How can I help? How can I preach this word? How can I share this 
with the people around me. And so Luther Academy, the seminary in Latvia, started saying, how can we be of help to these guys? Because right now in Europe, to find a place where you can get theological training, where you're actually going to be taught that the Bible is true, nearly impossible. There's not a lot of options in continental Europe to actually be taught that the Bible is true, to be trained for ministry. And so the Latvians said, well, maybe we can help. But you remember our map, right? Latvia, not exactly centrally located in Europe. <laughs> and so they were saying, well, what can we do? We're not really sure. And so they reached out to us. They reached out to congregations like yours, to pastors, and said, Missouri Synod, help us do something with this. And Missouri Synod said, sure. So they started putting something together, started thinking about how we can get these guys together to train them. And then, uh, this was in 2019, they were really putting this stuff together, they were ready to roll with it, and then the world ended. Right? COVID hit, and everything came to a screeching halt. And so they said, well, now what do we do? Well, all of these young people, all these new Lutherans, have been connecting with this stuff online. They're already online. Let's take it to them online. And so the Livonian Lutheran Project was launched in 2020. And they said, well, we're going to do an online theological class, and we're going to just kind of see how it goes. Right? They didn't really advertise it. They didn't make it a big deal. They just said, we're going to put it out there. And they you know, put out a couple feelers, and that was about it. They figured if they had four or five people come, it would be worth it. Right? And in most congregations, if you can have four or five people show up for a Bible study, it's worth doing, right? Yeah. And so, yeah, okay, sure, we'll, we'll do that. Over 20 people came to this class. Right. God brought these people to this class, and they said, this is going to be a thing. Like, we need to actually make this a program. And so Luther Academy said, all right, in order for us to do this right, we need to make a new Bachelor's of Theology program that is going to be accredited throughout the European Union. Because right now, Luther Academy is accredited for Latvia. Right? And I mean, we've all heard stories, you know, a person who's an immigrant comes from one country, they go into another country, that person was a, you know, a brain surgeon in their country, they come here and they have to collect garbage because they can't actually, their, their degree isn't recognized, right? So they said, well, we need to make sure this degree is recognized throughout the European Union. And in order to do that, they need a faculty. They need people who love to teach. Teaching is my greatest joy in the ministry. They need people who speak English. Because this program has to be taught in English. The official language of the European Union is English. So the program has to be taught in English. And they have to um, be credentialed. And as Pastor Shaver pointed out, as of a few weeks ago, I have a couple of extra letters that I get to put in front of my name. Right? As the Reverend Doctor. And also, these faculty have to live in the EU. Because we may say, well, this is an online program. Why do you need to you know, pick up your family and, and go to Europe? Because we have to live in the EU. And by doing that, we are going to be able to put together this program that is going into its uh, second full year of classes this fall. We are building this program from the ground up. And we are working together with the seminaries in the United States, with other partner churches in Europe, to try to put something together so that we can train these men. In that first group of 20, eight of them were Pakistanis. Now, when I say Pakistan, do you think, yeah, that's a stronghold of Christianity? No, we don't, right? It's a predominantly Muslim country. But through the work of LCMS missionary uh, Jay Doss in, in uh, Pakistan, 
there are men who are coming and saying, I want to serve as a pastor. And there are people who have not been Christians, who have become Christians and now want to become pastors. There are people who were other kinds of Christians who are saying, this isn't right, and wanting to become Lutheran. Okay? We're training them. And I want you to understand that we are talking about the people that they're going to serve are thousands of people. This isn't, you know, a couple of, uh, you know, a couple people here, a couple people there. This is thousands of people. And all throughout Europe, there are these enclaves of these confessing, confessing Lutheran Christians who need pastors so that they can plant their own congregations. And so for the Pakistanis, these men that I will be teaching will be serving people like this. And so this is a Lutheran congregation in Pakistan. Their digs look a little different than yours, right? Yeah. But yet, these people want to hear the same gospel that you hear. They want to receive the same sacraments that you receive. They want to be part of the same historic faith that we are part of. That's what's going on in Europe. We are serving students from 13 different countries, training them to serve as pastors throughout Europe and into parts of Asia. We even have some guys from Africa who have become part of this program as well. And thanks be to God that this isn't all on me <laughs> to do. That's a lot. Um, so we, we are, as I said, we're putting together a faculty. And part of that faculty includes men like Dr. Corey Rajak, who uh, he deployed to Latvia a few months ago. And so he's been there uh, teaching, uh, getting things ready. There are going to be three LCMS missionary pastors in Riga. There's going to be the, the Rajeks, Jerry Lawson, who was our missionary in St. Petersburg, up until March, and then Russia became a closed place for us. So now uh, he is in Riga, he's been reassigned, and then us. And so we are going to be there in person, working with people there on the ground. And it's because while this program is an online program primarily, there is also a in-person component to it. Twice a year, uh, we would gather these students together, once in the fall and once in the spring, for a week-long intensive class. And so it's in person that there's lectures, there's fellowship, and there's worship all together, right? And it's because, and I'm sure that the other guys and callers here can uh, hopefully uh, affirm this with me, sometimes some of the most formative parts of your theological education don't necessarily happen in the classroom, but they happen at the lunch table, right? As you're yeah. talking with your friends. Mm -hmm. Maybe a pr professor comes and joins you, right? This creates that opportunity for the in-person fellowship to build something together. And so one week has been spent in Riga. One week of classes has been done in Wittenberg. Yeah, in Wittenberg, the birthplace of the Reformation, the place where Luther himself taught. We are gathering together men who are going to continue this work, this 500-year process of preaching the gospel, of being Lutherans. That's the work that we're doing, helping to train these young men and training them so they can lead services so they can be able to, to help other people worship. And so uh, we have Dr. Just here, who <laughs> some of you recognize, right? Yeah. That's, my, yeah. that's my doctoral advisor. Right. Um, Dr. Just, the guy on the left. Yeah, this, yeah. this guy. Yeah. Um, and so he, he works very closely with uh, Eurasia Missions. And so he's over there quite a bit. I'm looking forward to working with them. 
And so they gather the people together for worship, these students for worship. Uh, this is our newsletter sign-up. If you'd like to learn more, uh, we'd love for you to sign up on there. Um, how, sorry, I got ahead of myself there. My brain started working faster than my tongue. <laughs> how, many, how many of you saw how Italy handled COVID? Yeah. Was it was it real gentle and you just kind of got to go out and do what you wanted? No. no Italy was locked down tight for a long time. One of the students became a Lutheran during COVID. When he came to an intensive class, he said this was one of the first times he was able to actually experience Lutheran worship in person, not on Zoom. Right. Can you imagine having a pastor who was only trained via Zoom? Yeah. That'd be a challenge, right? And so we need these guys to get together in person so that we can train them and that we can teach them. Because the goal is to teach them to be pastors. So that they can preach the word, that they can administer the sacraments. That's the work that we're doing. You know, there's been a change within mission work in the last uh, half decade. It used to be, and, and some of you may remember this, it used to be, hey, these people in this country over here, they need a bunch of money. Let's just send them a bunch of money. Right? Remember that? That's the way missions used to be, right? Just, just ship them a bunch of money and everything will be fine. Many of these churches throughout the world now are saying, we don't need money. We need people. We need people who can teach us and train us to do this work. That's what's being done. And so that's where I and my family come in. I have been called by the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod Office of International Mission to serve as a theological educator at Luther Academy to help prepare pastors over, and this isn't much of an exaggeration, over about a quarter of the planet. All of Europe and into parts of Asia are being served through the work that we're doing at Luther Academy. That's incredible stuff. It's just breathtaking to even think of the scope of what's being done. And while my position there is pretty well solidified, um, my family's coming with me too. My beautiful wife, our very sleepy son. Um, I, I appreciate you indulging. And normally he would come and, and tell you about the school that he's going to go to. Um, because one of the questions people often have is, well, if you're going to this foreign country, you know, what language do they speak, right? Um, in Latvia, people speak Latvian, but there's only about two million people on earth who speak Latvian. So and they so need so far, to... we are not one of them. And so the Latvian people need to be able to have some other kind of language in their, uh, in their knowledge set in order to function. So prior to the fall of the Soviet Union, people were taught Latvian and Russian. Pe following the fall of the Soviet Union, people were taught Latvian and English. So anyone who grew up in the late 80s um, and through the 90s and stuff, they all know at least some amount of English as well. But Carter is going to go to an international school where they speak and teach only English at the school. Um, <laughs> and, and, yeah, so the International School of Riga, it's a, a preschool through 12 uh, program. They have 300 students from 40 different countries there. So Carter's excited about getting to know kids from all these different countries. He's, he's really excited. And if he was out here, he would say that he's excited to uh, tell them about Jesus, too. Which, we never told him to say that. He himself was like, this is what I'm going to do. We're like, okay, buddy, that's awesome. The kid's faith is incredible. Yeah. And then, uh, sweetheart, you're, what are you going to be doing? Sure. So, uh, I am a nurse by trade. Um, unfortunately, to get uh, my degree over there, I would have to speak Latvian. Uh, like I said before, I don't. Um, so, I'll be looking to do uh, like volunteer uh, ministries, uh, and, like health ministries. There are um, about 40,000 uh, Ukrainian refugees that have fled to Luka alone. Um, and you know, 600,000 people plus 40,000, that's a big chunk of extra people. 
Um, so there's a lot of work to be done um, with refugees there, with health ministries, and any other things that I can help out with. Um, I'll be working with uh, Lutheran Academy. Um, I don't know in what sort of capacity that, that is. A lot of that will be um, waiting until um, we get on the ground and get settled a little bit um, before looking around and seeing what needs to be done, uh, what is being done, what probably should be done, and see where I can uh, help out. Um, I'm also passionate about pro-life ministry, so this, this last few days have been awesome. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but um, uh, there is still work to be done, so I'll be working with that. And then also, uh, one of the things that have been requested of the pastors who are over there is to actually work to start an English-speaking service at a church in uh, Latvia, and hopefully over time to plant an English-speaking congregation over there. Because if there's 300 kids from 40 different countries who speak English, there's a bunch of people in Latvia who need to hear the gospel in English too, right? And so we're hoping to be able to do that. So if you're excited about this and you're wanting to know well, how can I help how can I do this one of the things that I would ask is that you would pray for us so if you can pass those down the tables that would be a help uh, normally Carter does this part too like he helps me pass things out so I'm like I don't know what <laughs> so this slide here is terrible for a presentation because it has way too many words on it but it's a prayer. And so we're, we're passing out this uh, paper that actually has a prayer on it. Because you know, a lot of times people will say, pray for us. And you're like, I don't know what to pray for. Uh, so this is a prayer that you can use. And, and we wanted to put it in front of you. It's actually from the Riga prayer book of 1719. So it really dates back, right? And it's a prayer for one whose father is traveling abroad. And it's a prayer for success for their work. And while you might not think of me as your father, which you shouldn't, right? But um, this does remind us of the fact that our brothers and sisters in Europe sometimes use terms that we as American Lutherans don't necessarily use, right? To refer to a pastor as a priest or father, not really something that, that causes a lot of heartache. Um, they don't have synod presidents, they don't have district presidents, they have archbishops and bishops, right? Um, that's just the way that they function there. And so, while we're there, I'm going to be subject to the Archbishop of Riga. Right? Um, so, that's, you know, one of the things that, again, we can ask for is that you would, that you would pray for us. But, also, we would invite you to learn more, sign up for our newsletters. Um, I think Lindsay has some of extra copies of our most recent newsletter. Huh? Oh, yeah. yeah. Did you guys get this? Okay. Um, that prayer, just real quick, that prayer is also included in this book called the Lutheran Prayer Companion. That's actually where I got it from. Yeah. 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 So we have these for sale. If anybody wants to. <laughs> it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful little prayer. Uh, it's not that little. It's a wonderful prayer book. Yeah. It, it is actually a wonderful book that collects Lutheran prayers from, from the centuries. It's a fantastic book. Um, so, also we invite you to spread the word. Let other people know about this. Um, one of the things that has been done differently with the way uh, LCMS mission work has been done in the past, we're actually part of the first group that were part of this new way of doing it. So, it used to be that when you received a call to serve as a missionary, they said, here's the amount of money you need to raise, get out there and raise it, and you were cast into fundraising purgatory and you, you, know, <laughs> had to, you just had to, to do it, right? And spend all this time and go and sing for your supper. And I understand that you guys have recently been uh, reading the Didache, where if a pastor comes around looking for money, you should stone him and drive him out of town. <laughs> which is good, which is good, because I'm not here to do that. I'm not here to beg from you. Um, because we're doing things differently now, right? Now the way that we're doing things is six months after accepting a call, you deploy. We accepted this call back in March. Well, I be, I was officially working with Synod back in March. Um, and they're actually having us deploy within five months, which means that in the middle of August, we are wheels up 
heading to Europe, right? And so the, the really great part of that is while there's still that excitement, where there's, while there's still that joy of getting to do this work, we get to actually go and get, get to work, right? Um, but that also means that we don't always get to go and visit all the congregations and all the people that might be interested in helping. And so if you know people in other congregations, if you have friends and relatives in other congregations, um, let them know. Say, hey, this really awesome missionary came into our congregation and told us about this stuff. Um, but if, if you would like to support the work that's, that's being done, we would be glad to have you partner with us. Um, but again, I don't have to come here and beg, right? Because we've, we've done the funding of mission work a little differently now, where Mission Central, how many of you are familiar with Mission Central? A couple of you, okay? Mission Central is this organization in Iowa that raises funds for mission work. And they do incredible stuff. Um, and so they help us get kind of that initial amount that's needed to get deployed, but then we need people who also want to come alongside and support over the long term, right? Who want to help keep us on the field. So that's what we get to do. We get to come and just tell you about it. And if you want to help, awesome. If you don't, that's fine, right? I'm not here to beg from anybody. Um, we're excited about this work. And I hope that you are too. And I hope that you are excited to hear about the incredible things that God is doing in Europe. That the gospel is being taught again in its purity and we are going to work to ensure that it continues to be so. So, thank you very much for the opportunity to come and be with you. Thank you for the time to present to you, to tell you about this stuff. Um, we have about five minutes before we need to get ready for church. Uh, so, I would love to hear what questions you guys have for us. And I, I know some of you have asked questions during it, which is awesome. I love that. But I know some of you have some other questions. Yes? We're still figuring that out. Um, so, in in some in some missionary contexts, like uh, in Africa and South America and stuff, they have missionaries live on kind of a compound. Um, Europe doesn't like we don't need a, a missionary compound in Riga, right? So we're actually working with a realtor to find a place where we can rent long term. So we're trying we're traveling with two dogs, and so. Um, we are trying to find a house that has a backyard for them um, because we've been living on the road now for the last month and a half. Oh, wow. And um, we actually got an Airbnb house in Boise for a week. And so we actually got to live in a house for a little while. And our dogs are loving having it, the ability to walk around a little more. So um, we're, we're hoping for a house. But I mean, there's lots of apartments that are, that are pretty good cool for us as well. So we're, we're still working on that. Yes, you've been there. Yeah. No, no, I have not. So it's although I will say that we have watched on YouTube just about every video on there about Riga. And if you're interested, honestly, if you're interested, go to YouTube and just type in Riga Latvia, and there's walking tours that you can watch of people just walking around through Old Town. Now I know there's one of one of those three countries where you where. Latvia is, uh -huh. they're known for having street singers, like people that sing a cappella just on the street. Is that what I mean? I don't know. I mean, in some videos there are some people who do some of the They just burst into beautiful. I know, I know that the Latvian people love to sing. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know about There's a, that. There's one of the countries that's known for that. Huh, and I interesting. And I don't remember if it was Estonia or Latvia or... Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. And is the uh, Latvian government pretty much like the Estonian government, or they set up similar with constitution? And the way they go? I believe Estonia so. is pretty pretty good off right now. They, they've done some things really well. Yes, I believe I believe so. And um, in Latvia, the church still has a certain amount of influence culturally speaking, um, but even in Latvia, right? I mean, five hundred years of, of Lutheranism. There's still some very strange things that happen there. That, like, you go to church, but you don't. You're not supposed to like really, really believe this stuff, right? I was I was talking with uh, one of my uh, Latvian compatriots recently, and he told me that it's not uncommon for young people to be kicked out of their parents' home 
if they take Christianity too seriously. That's the situation. Right. And yeah, you're too weird. Right. Yes? How long do you not have to quarantine for? They don't. They don't they have don't? to quarantine. No. So, um, and because thankfully COVID is kind of where we're at right now, we don't have to quarantine either when we get there. Um, but we found a company that will handle the transportation of our dogs. So, yeah. So it's it's very helpful. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> in Seattle, I had a friend that had been raised in Sweden. Uh huh. And every time she went inside the church, which she said kind of was state church, and she was wondering why don't they go like on Sunday like she heard from other people that came there from America and somebody of authority said well we do use it we use it for weddings and the, that kind of thing right well every time she went inside of a church over there and she was young and everything when when I met her she said well I'm walking proof that when you are born, you get a true knowledge of God and the difference between right and wrong. So when she came to America, it quite surprised her that she met several fellows and she was young, about 26. Finally, she met a fellow that was raised Lutheran. And when she went inside of a Lutheran church, she said, the amazing thing was everything when the pastor started talking is like I'd heard it before. And she said, I never heard it in church in Sweden, but <clears throat> a knowledge of God and the difference between right and wrong, she said. So when people tell you that, just to tell you, I'm walking proof that that's a true statement. Sure. Because she go. didn't get any real words until she was like 26 years old. Right. Yeah. So that's a good thing for you to go out there and, and know that, that that is really true. So you'd be dealing with people, if they're looking, they'll find it. Right. And that'll be you. Right. And there and there are people who are looking. Yeah. And and they're connecting with it. And and it's it's God bringing this growth. I mean, it is yeah. it is incredible yeah. what's happening. And yeah. it is entirely God doing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, any let's do one last question and then Pastor Shaver's giving me the eye that it's time to wrap it up. So <laughs> <laughs> any any last questions on anything? Yes. Uh, what cultural shocks are you expecting? Um, one of the cultural shocks that I'm expecting is um, we are going, we're doing our best to not have a vehicle when we go over there because many European cities, they're pretty compact, right? And so you don't have to have a car. So we're, we're shooting for that. Um, there's, uh, there's different cuisine, right? Different foods and stuff. Um, one of the things that's really important, yeah, Lindsay just kind of whispered it. Uh, <laughs> Latvians and Eastern Europeans in general do not like small talk at oh, all. Yeah, yeah. they they do not care for small talk. Um, uh, I'll tell you another story real quick. So the, this <laughs> Latvian that I was talking with, he was with a friend who grew up in, in the United States. They were walking around. It was near Christmas time in, in Riga. And there was a bunch of people in line outside of a church. And they came up to this uh, older lady who was standing outside the church, and they said, well, you know, what, why is everyone waiting in line? And she just turned and looked at him and said, voices. <laughs> and, and it was because there was a, a musical group called Voices performing at the church. It was just, we are here for voices. That is One it. Word. I am not going to tell you why or what <laughs> it is. Just, that is that. No right? context, no nothing. Right. So, <laughs> right. Yeah. So, so that's going to be an interesting culture shock. But we're, we're looking forward to it. Carter's actually very very sleepy. So right. that'll, be, that'll be hard for him. Yeah. Uh, All right. Thank you so much, everyone. This has been an absolute joy to get to tell you about this. This is our most recent uh, newsletter. Although, it, I, if we would have been thinking about it, we should have included the photo of, of Nick and I together at graduation. It's true. Yeah. 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 Uh -huh. but, <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, everybody. All right. Why don't we? Um, do you want to? Would you mind closing us in prayer? Yes, I'd be happy to close us right. in prayer. Let us pray. 
Almighty and merciful God, we are grateful to you for the work of the Holy Spirit that creates faith in our hearts. We pray for the work of uh, missionaries throughout the world, that the Holy Spirit would continue to do his work, bringing people to faith in Christ. We thank you also for the wonderful work and ministry that's happening here in Nampa. We pray that you would bless this congregation, bless their pastor, bless all those who gather together to hear the word and receive the sacrament at this altar. We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen.